Well, I finally got on board the right ship. <laughs> I have, uh, I don't know whether it's a unique distinction of having been persecuted on both sides of the issue. <laughs> So I once got in, in trouble for uh, teaching evolution. Now, how could I do that? Well, number one, I'm even older than I look. Okay, so this was a long time ago. <laughs> public schools. I went to public school in Arcadia, Florida, you know, about 100 miles south of here. And when I was in public school, they started with devotionals piped in over the intercom, Bible reading, prayer, devotionals, and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, I listened and learned. We had programs, you know, actual Christmas programs, and it was even called Christmas, okay, all those kind of things. <laughs> and so I knew what it was like to be a Christian, but I was also a science nerd. Okay. And so my wife and I, who I met later as a, a high school chemistry class, by the way, and the chemistry's been right for the last 56 years. Sweet, okay. <laughs> uh, so, of course, I could have profited a lot from the message on marriage earlier, but it's not too late. I'm still alive, okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I was busy teaching evolution. I'd gone off to college, and even in those days, it was pretty likely <clears throat> that once you got to college in science, it was going to be evolution without question. And of course, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a teacher, so I wanted to learn all of this as much as I could, so it became become my turn to teach it. So I was really laying evolution on thick in Arcadia. And uh, I found out later that there were actually, you know, groups getting together. Tar and feathers were suggested at one point. <laughs> then, well, he's young, you know, he'll catch on, he'll learn a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but I realized, and this is kind of scary, well, I realized one thing, I'm not cut out to be a high school teacher. <sighs> the... It's social problems galore. Horma, no, no. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do with all that stuff. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, so I, I, but I also realized these, these kids were still at home. And to this day, uh, you know, there's 72 churches in DeSoto County in the population. You know, the town is still only about 7,000. Of course, a lot of them are out in the country. But, uh, you know, they're, they're tied in with their parents. If I could teach college, then they'd be away from those influences of their parents and church youth groups and stuff like that. And then I could explain to them what evolution's really all about. And so I was kind of an evangelical evolutionist and very enthused about it. Uh, and so, um, you know, things I like to explain is imagine, uh, you know, that uh, you were like Charles Darwin back in the 1800s. And, and uh, uh, Darwin had actually... Um, well, put it bluntly, uh, pretty much flunked out of Bible college. It was called religious studies then, but it was about the same as Bible college, and that just didn't really appeal to Darwin at all. He failed medical school. That wasn't any good. He wasn't any good at that either. Uh, but he was from a family of gentry in England. His grandfather was a noted early evolutionist and so on. And so here he was, 21 years old, and pretty much an academic failure, and so his dad decided to punish him. And he said, all right, Charles, you know, you can't, didn't do any good in Bible studies. You didn't do any good in medical college. I'm sending you on a five-year cruise around the world. I wish my dad had punished me like that. <laughs> but he was a naturalist. He just loved studying living things. And he was a real detailed observer and things like that. So he was put on board as the chief uh, naturalist for the HMS Beagle on a five-year voyage around the world. Well, you can imagine a young Englishman in green, foggy England, you know, hits the, the rainforests of South America. Wow, all the colorful birds and flowers and chirping sounds and just absolutely mind-blowing uh, to a young Englishman and so on. They sailed all the way around South America off to the famous Galapagos Islands. Then he saw something else. It was actually there when the sea turtles hatched out of the sand and made their mad dash for the ocean. But even before they hatched out, there were a variety of predators and big birds and other things just waiting for the little sea turtles to pop out of the sand. Gulp, 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 gulp. 
you know, that you didn't want. Or maybe only three out of a hundred ever got their first taste of seawater. Ha, ah, made it to the ocean. Gulp, gulp. They got eaten up by predators in the ocean. Maybe on average only one out of a hundred sea turtles would eventually return as an adult to that island to lay eggs for another generation. And so Darwin noticed two things in this voyage around the world. Lots and lots of variety. Stunning, fantastic variety. Everywhere you looked, it didn't matter what. But then he noticed struggle. Struggle for survival. Animals, you know, trying to find enough to eat, trying to get away from predators, trying to find the right kind of soil to grow it if there were seeds from a plant and so on. And so he spent 20 years trying to put those two things together. There was a dazzling beauty and variety that we see, what uh, Bob Carver talks so much about, that I am a sunset nut. I just love, I've never taken enough pictures of sunsets. <laughs> and at the first, it wasn't to give glory to God, now it is. But there's all this variety, the same thing among living things. But there's a struggle, death everywhere, struggle and death, struggle and death. And so what does this all mean? Well, after 20 years of meditating on this, ah, I've got the answer. Uh, you know, with all that variety out there, some varieties are going to be more fit to survive than others. With all that struggle going on, a lot of them are going to die. And so obviously there'll be a survival of the fittest. That was the earth-shaking revelation that Darwin had over a 20-year period. Interestingly enough, Russ, Alfred Russell Wallace thought of the same thing overnight during a malarial fever. <laughs> and he actually co-presented at the Royal Society that idea of survival of the fittest would change simple varieties into more complex varieties, more complex varieties, and gradually build up uh, the, what he called the production of higher animals. And so survival of the fittest was not just about struggle between different things going on now. His whole quote went like this. Uh, Evolution's a fact, and what makes it happen is the war of nature. Now, I didn't learn it that way. When I learned evolution, what attracted me to evolution was evolution was upward, onward progress. Things getting better and better and better as time went on. And who knew, you know, how good it could really get. And so it was all this upward, onward progress that appealed to me, you know, with that. But then later on, you know, after I became a creationist, I read what Darwin actually said. And this is uh, Dar the way Darwin put his own theory. Thus, from the war of nature... By the way, if somebody asks you, what is natural selection? That's your answer. Well, Darwin made up the term. What did he mean by it? The war of nature. What do you mean war of nature? Darwin described it. Famine and death. Struggle and death. Thus, from the war of nature, famine and death, what happens? Well, things die out. The earth becomes desolate. Fertile land dries up and blows away. It's terrible. No. For Darwin, it was exactly the opposite. All that struggle and death, what a Christian would call what? The curse resulting from sin. Darwin said that's the pathway to progress. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, to production of higher animals, branching evolutionary tree, follows from all of that. And that's what I was thinking. I didn't realize, I didn't emphasize the war of nature, famine and death, I call it natural selection. Selection is choosing the very best. Okay. And natural means nature's doing it. You don't really need God. Now, I was willing to let my students believe in God as long as they also believed in evolution. And every evolutionist knows as soon as you can get a Christian student to say, okay, okay, I still believe in God, but I believe in evolution. And if he thinks about it long enough, he's going to say, well, let's see, natural selection works whether there's a God or not. So you don't really need God. He's just an extra thrown in on the side. It's really nature that's doing it. Kind of clever, huh? And so I finally found out about that. And when I found out about that, I realized it did change my thinking. But I'd have students ask me in class, well, 
You can't, what about evolution and God? Could evolution be God's means of creation? And I didn't believe it, but I was willing to say to my students, well, sure. Now, you can believe in God. God used evolution. Evolution is just upward, onward progress. And saying it that way made it sound like something God would do. But according to Darwin, that something was struggle and death. Time, chance, struggle, and death. Time, chance, struggle, and death. Time, chance, struggle, and death. <laughs> I said that over and over again at every course I taught at Clearwater Christian, so the students finally begin to abbreviate it, TCSD, time, chance, struggle, and death. Time, chance, struggle, and death. We're responsible for making life uh, evolve from a few simple beginnings to sea life, to land life, to apes, and finally to man. It was struggle and death that brought mankind into existence. And I didn't bother to tell students, I would have known it just from the devotionals piped in over the intercom, that uh, scripture has exactly the opposite. It wasn't struggle and death that led to man, it was man's rebellion and sin that led to struggle and death. Struggle and death didn't exist before that. And I began to realize that, huh, okay, evolution can be kind of depressing. Now, they don't teach this. When I was teaching evolution, I taught the upbeat part. I didn't teach the depressing part, that evolution is really millions of years of struggle and death until what? Death wins. Okay, and if you've ever seen interviews with, you know, evolutionists talking, well, you know, you just got to accept the fact we're all going to die, we're all going to die, we're all going <laughs> to But, you know, our ancestors will be better, or our descendants will be better and better and better. So I thought, well, that is kind of sad, but I, I even had, uh, you know, sometimes after I became a Christian, I uh, taught creation, but, you know, I wondered if the Christian students really believed what I was saying that evolutionists believed. So I, once in a while, I'd wheel in a television set when they were having evolutionists on. And one time, two famous evolutionists were on, and it was audience question time. So audience asked questions. So what does the future hold? What does the future hold? What's evolution all about? Well, as a young, naive evolutionist, I would say, oh, boy, you know, IQs of 300, you know, people could run the two-minute mile. It would just be awesome. And oranges this big around, you know, and who knows how big the watermelons would be, <laughs> on and on and on. But they ask a paleontologist, fossil expert, an evolutionary paleontologist, what does the future hold? And he says, well, I'm a fossil expert. And the only thing I'm sure of, when you look at the record of evolution, every species eventually goes extinct. And it looks like that will happen to man as well. And the audience breaks out into applause. We, we're all going to go to extinct. That's something to look forward to. <laughs> what? Okay. The other evolutionist was an astronomer. So they ask him, you know, what does the future hold? What does the future hold? So the astronomer says, the only thing I'm sure of is next April on the cosmic calendar that condenses five billion years into an Earth year. Next April on the cosmic calendar, the sun will get so hot it'll expand and Earth itself will be incinerated and obliterated. The audience breaks in the house into applause. We, if we're not extinct, we get incinerated. We get to return to us. So millions of years of struggle and death till death wins. Now, evolutionists don't usually stress that. So we need to stress it for them. We need to let them know what evolution is really all about. Well, how did I find that out? I never found it out in any of my science classes. None of my science classes ever assigned me to read anything from Darwin. Because Darwin's got a lot of really embarrassing stuff in his book. So they want to tell you what it means in their words. But I don't know whether you can believe this or not. I got invited to a Bible study. I was positively amazed that people in what was then the 20th century would still study a dusty, old, outmoded book like the Bible. But three words, the keys to successful evangelism. How can you get an evolutionist to come to a Bible study? Free coffee and donuts. Okay, that does it. <laughs> and besides that, it was a family thing. I could take my wife. Free coffee and donuts and the cheap date night? Wow, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so, away we went to this Bible study. Fortunately, my wife was already a Christian, and no thanks to me. In fact, uh, we used to go, I used to go to her church youth group a lot. 
uh, and learn stuff, even though I didn't believe it all at the time. But then it's when I started reading the Bible in earnest for the first time. Have you ever read the first part? Start in Genesis? Do you know what it says? And in the first couple of chapters, it talks about a wonderful world where there was no death, where animals just ate plants. They weren't eating each other. They weren't eating people. And, you know, I, I, do people really believe this stuff? Well, you know, that's not the world that we live in. How can, what, what, it's what the Bible teachers say. Read on. And so the first couple of chapters are about all that wonderful world that God created. Chapter 3 <laughs> introduces us to man, sin, and struggle and death enter the world. And so the corruption of creation, Paul calls it in Romans 8, the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it because of sin. And that sin was, became so grievous, the earth was so filled with violence and corruption. Well, violence and corruption is what evolution is all about. But according to Genesis 6, violence and corruption grieved God to his heart so that he was sorry he'd made man on the planet. And he resolved to destroy that first role of the flood to give it a fresh start with Noah and his family. And as a non-Christian reading that, I thought, well, that's terrible. God created a perfect world, no death, no disease, no disaster. We make one little mistake. That's the way I looked at turning your back completely on God and going your own way, one little mistake. And God wipes us out. Teacher said, read on. <laughs> okay. And of course, he didn't wipe us out. He wiped out all the dry land animals in whose, breath was the nostrils, or in whose nostrils was the breath of life, except those that he brought to Noah on the ark. And so he prepared a way of escape, and he let Noah preach for 120 years. The you know, flood didn't sneak up on anybody. Everybody by that time had heard about this crazy big uh, barge that Noah was building and all and so on. And so God, then they got off the ark and began to multiply and refill the earth, and then sin hit again. And then God set the final solution, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you have been a lot. How many of you have been to the Big Answers in Genesis Museum up in uh, northern Kentucky? Oh, good, good. I see a lot of you. We actually took, a, what was it, about a year and a half leave from Clearwater to help them get that started up there a long time ago, back in the 90s. Uh, and it's, it's really an awesome place to visit. And so, uh, you know, I begin to look at this again. Maybe there is evidence. What would a scientist say about this? Creation, corruption, catastrophe, Christ? And uh, they use that theme, extended to seven seas, which actually, the first time they had seven seas was when I wrote the biology department brochure for Clearwater Christian College. I enlarged it to seven seas, just for the parallel. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion for the Tower of Babel, and then Christ's cross consummation at the end of it. Uh, and so creation, there is struggle and death, but it's from man's sin. It wasn't there to start with. It won't be there at the end. It's conquered by Christ. Life wins. So you've got a choice. Millions of years of struggle and death until death wins or life wins. New life in Christ. And initially I thought to myself, wow, I can see why somebody would want to leave, believe the Bible. The Bible has a happy ending just like all those other fairy tales. And I bet some of you have had that in your own family. Family that means a lot to you. Friends that mean a lot to you. You've told them what the gospel message is. You tell them, you know, how wonderful it is to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And they say, no, thank you. In fact, I'd rather die. Well, why? It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything. Christ did it for you. It just sounds too good to be true. And so that's kind of the way I was. I could see it. I could appreciate it. My wife was enthused about it beyond all measure. So what I want to emphasize to you, and this is repeating a theme that you've seen and the other speakers you've heard today, we're not talking about a side issue, something that just, you know, comes up now and then. We're talking about a basic salvation issue. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean that you have to go out and take courses in creation science so you know how to answer all kinds of scientific questions about this, that, and the other. 
No, I mean what Paul meant when he wrote this to Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21. He warns Timothy to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of what? Science falsely so-called. That's how it says it in the King James, and that's the one I really like for this particular verse. The word science there is broader than our experimental science alone, but in all cases, it just refers to knowledge gained by human beings looking at the world around them, not looking up to the God who authored the world around them and is saving it for the sin it plunged itself into. And so it applies to science. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Why? Some professing have erred concerning the faith. The biggest trick, and there are lots of tricks, involved in promoting evolution. But why did it succeed? There are lots of other anti-Christian philosophies that have been around for years and years and years and years. Why did evolution succeed? Or other, you know, opposition to Christianity failed. That word science has a lot to do with it. Remember, this is the middle 1800s. <laughs> and Darwin's ignorance of genetics, ecology, biochemistry, cell biology was phenomenal. He knew far less than a sixth grader did about any of those things. And made outrageous scientific blunders wholesale. But nobody else knew about that at that time. But he wanted to call it science because physics had begun to produce some wonders, some practical applications that were making life a lot easier. And science began to be, oh, look what science can do for us. You know, we can send messages from one city to another along a wire. Now you don't even need the wire. <laughs> Cell phones, TVs, you know, all that came along later. And so science was, see and of course it was, the original scientists were building on biblical faith and seeing the development of things like that, cures and medicine. Darwin was before the germ theory came along and so on. But people began to see the benefits of science. And if you called it science, the chief characteristic of science, it's a way of testing ideas against observation. You're looking at things you can repeat over and over again. You can see what happens. You can make a prediction, see if it comes true. And so it looked like it was objective, you know, built on real nature. And real science is. Experimental science is exactly that. Evolution is not science. Never was science. Never will be science. Never could be science. It's a belief about the past made up about, by men who weren't there, men who make lots of mistakes, lots and lots and lots of mistakes, men who don't know everything, men who could possibly know everything. It's naturalistic, humanistic philosophy masquerading as science. It's science falsely so-called. To earn a respect it could never earn on its own. Uh, as a matter of, and I think I really want to try to emphasize that. I've tried to talk Ken Ham into it for years. <laughs> Haven't always succeeded. But I did a lecture, and for, well, I guess, 25 or 30 years, I did creation evolution debates on five different continents. And it was uh, pretty exciting, I think, saying say it that way for sure. But I got so in my talks, I kind of used a formula like this. I could say, well, evolutionists say such and so. But then I'd say, but scientists have shown that that's false. Creationists say such and so, and scientists have found evidence that supports uh, that particular event in history. And so the first time I tried that, I really overdid it. I constantly made a difference for, between evolutionists and scientists. Evolutionists say this, but scientists say that. Evolutionists say this, but scientists say the opposite. And so the first question at the end of that, that lecture was a prof in the back of the room. Why were you set? You're constantly distinguishing between evolutionists and scientists. And I thought to myself, yeah. Okay, so I heartily recommend it, by the way. Try to train yourself to never say scientists, you know, the problem is between science and scripture. The problem areas are between science and evolution. 
Science contradicts virtually everything evolutionists have ever dreamed up. And they just keep changing it and renaming it and stuff like that all the time. But scientists are continuously discovering things that are very helpful to creationists looking at how to apply the lessons of history we read in the scripture. And anyway, so that what I mean by a salvation issue is I was a scientist. Evolution was science. Bible's faith. Well, everything's faith. We're finite human beings. We can't live without faith. None of us is going to know everything. And so we have to live by faith. It can be a reasonable faith based on the written record of what God actually did. Wow. That's really what brought me over the line. <laughs> I began to think about all the science that I knew and the science books that I'd kept. And some of the science books I kept, I kept for the humor value. I just couldn't believe scientists used to believe this, that, and the other. You know, so much had changed. Do you know any science textbook that's been around for 2,000 years that people are still looking at it for answers to things? You don't, do you? Do you know a science textbook that's been around 200 years that people are still using? You might say Darwin's, but they aren't using Darwin's theory. They're just giving his name. To, they can't. It doesn't work. None of his stuff works at all. And so, but what, the Bible has been around about Christ for 2,000 years, and even before that. Wow, that has stood the test of time. But I couldn't believe that. I couldn't. People ask me when I was in college, you want to go to church with us? And I'd say, well, I don't know. You got a church social going on, or you going to the beach, or you know what, you know. I wasn't interested in learning about God, because that was just a myth. But so, did he have a social program? It couldn't even listen to the claims of Christ because I already knew that God was a myth. And so it keeps people from even listening, people in your own family. You know, in the back of their mind, yeah, yeah, that's just hokey stuff. Science, no, it's not science. It's science falsely so-called. Here's one of the main false things. And unfortunately, I only learned this about two years ago. <laughs> And so for 30-some years, I wrote books that I might have used this phrase or this title in, natural selection, yes, evolution, no. If I had computer skills, I would have erased that before I put it up. <laughs> but change, yes, evolution, no. But natural selection isn't any kind of a scientific theory. It's naturalistic philosophy. It's a satanic, very seductive, pseudo-scientific synonym for struggle and death. And every time you're tempted to use natural selection, you'll find you can substitute time, chance, struggle, and death, and people know what you're talking about. But that sounds mean. That sounds bad. Time, chance, struggle, and death. How can you make things better with that? Natural selection, that sounds good. We have to admit, the evolutionists have been winning the war of words. You know, one of the biggest lies you may have learned on a grade school campus, ever hear the old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me? That's a lie. It ought to be rephrased this way. Sticks and stones can, make my can break my bones, but words can kill. Hitler's words killed millions of people. Stalin's words killed millions more people. Mao's words killed millions more than that. And Planned Parenthood's words have killed millions more than all of them put together. Words can kill. Or they can support the wrong idea. They can trick you into buying something that's really a sham or a fake. And so there is struggle and death. And this is an example that I used to use. It's been used so often. The forests around England, there's a Back in the 1850s, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, a dark colored moss stands out against the, the light uh, lichen crust on this uh, tree bark. And then uh, factories, you know, pump soot in the atmosphere, kills uh, the lichens. And so now the dark colored moth uh, is so camouflaged, you can't even hardly see it there. And it's where that 1950s is, there's actually a black moth, but the white moth stands out. And so I used to say, see, that shows natural selection and action, struggle and death making things better. It changed the moth from mostly light, camouflaged on lichen, to mostly dark. Well, it turns out that's not even true. 
uh, the dark and light moths both existed at the same time. It didn't change them into another type, kind of moth. And in the 1850s, the dark colored moth didn't hang around to get eaten. It flew off to another forest. <laughs> they actually have an instinct that can recognize their background. When the pollution was cleared up, the light moth moved back in. And so just variation within kind has nothing to do with evolution, but it's the only example of evolution in action the Smithsonian could find to put in their display representing evolution when creationists couldn't put any. Uh, you've heard this, you know, the uh, finches, these little birds on the Galapagos Islands that, that Darwin collected. Uh, Darwin didn't make much out of them himself. Some of these birds have big beaks. Some have medium-sized beaks. Some have little beaks. By the way, there is nothing wrong with having a big beak. <laughs> a lot of us are blessed with it. <laughs> okay, so, but at any rate, <laughs> you say, well, so what? They're, they're little finches. You can buy them in pet stores and stuff. Oh, but they, you know, the little beak birds eat little seeds. The big beak birds eat big seeds. Wow, okay. <laughs> yes, there are lots of very, Darwin explained it the same way a creationist would. When he was on the South American mainland, he saw finches with different beak types living together, eating different sizes of seeds. When they blew over on the vegetation mats of the Galapagos Islands, the big beaked birds sort of survived with the big seeds. The little beak birds survived with little seeds and could catch insects. And so the trait has to be there before it can be selected. Darwin had no clue where the new traits came from. He fell for Lamarck's error of thinking the environment could change heredity, make us become something different. Modern evolutionist, neo-Darwinist, says, no, it's mutations. Okay, that's where the new traits come from. Well, mutations are real. Natural selection is not even real. It's just a seductive synonym for struggle and death. Uh, but mutations are real. The problem is mutations, yes. Evolution, no. Mutations make a mess out of things. This is a redrawn from one of my uh, evolution books when I was in college. Genetic burden, genetic load. A turkey born from an unfertilized egg, a head wobbled from side to side from neurological disorder, feathers missing in patches. So mutations explain, uh, explain the origin of defects and disease, but not at all the origin of brand new traits. Nothing like that. One evolution has admitted the, the mutations we observe are not the ones we see, and they change only genes that already exist. The most you can get from variations are, or from mutations are just variation within kind, the kind of variation that happened after the fall, after time, chance, struggle, and death begin to infect the world because of human sin. That's where we get parasites and predators and things like that that didn't exist originally. Uh, sometimes, I hope I'm not being wrong, but sometimes when I hear, you know, God created everything, I always slip in a little, God created every good thing. And I think, you know, that's the thrust of the Genesis 131 passage, that God saw all he cre had created, and behold, it was all very good. Well, what about the flu virus? What about the tapeworm? Uh, you know, what about hungry predators? You know, all, did God create them? No, I don't think he did. God created every good thing. Those things are a result of mutations, of damage, of the struggle for survival that happened after sin. That's where the bad things came from. <laughs> well, I had an interesting experience in Australia. I spent a lot of time in Australia for, from the 70s, 80s, into the 90s. And uh, so I was speaking at a university in um, Adelaide in South Australia. And oh, the place was packed out with students, primarily because the students had put up a nice poster around campus. Uh, and the poster said, come here, Professor Parker from America, a lecture on the flat earth. Okay, that was how they advertised the creation talk. <laughs> so the place was filled, you know, to hear me talk about a flat earth and so on. But of course, I talked about uh, creation. I usually use the big three. Evidence for creation was DNA, the genetic alphabet that God can use to write out all of our characteristics and the characteristics of other things. And then mutation and struggle as the origin of bad things. And then finally fossils as evidence for Noah's, well, not finally, next to finally. And then the last was how God in Christ 
redeems us from the effects of the curse. And uh, so I was talking about this, but at that time, uh, we, they changed later, but at that time, ICR asked the speakers not to mention the Bible in their initial presentation. So I talked about DNA and, and uh, variant genetics and the fossils. And then it was question time. And uh, so sure enough, you know, one of the professors raises her hand and says, uh, well, you know, if you believe God created everything, why do we have parasites and, and birth defects and, and, and all this kind of stuff? And so I said, well, I'm glad you asked, but you ask a why question. A why really belongs to the area of philosophy and theology, not, not science. And the answer is, where did those bad things came, come from? They came from sin. <laughs> she shrieked. <laughs> and those building cutters shook a little. Big veins popped out on her neck. <laughs> I thought she was going to have a stroke and die on the spot, but she turned around and tromped out of the auditorium with her high heels chipping concrete out of the floor. She went. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, that was kind of a violent reaction. <laughs> so a little farther on, I'm in Perth, Australia, on the west side instead of the south side. And uh, I get called in for radio interview. By this time, I found out that fair play is not part of the Australian vocabulary. So the uh, receptionist says, well, when he's finished this program, he'll call you in, ask you who you are, what you're doing here at your program, and then ask you some questions. And I thought, maybe yeah, maybe no. So I go in there, and sure enough, it was, you know, it was kind of a step. Oh, you're one of those creationists, huh? And so, you know, how, how come you can... We have, how come, how come we, we stand on two legs when we were designed to go on all fours? And uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll race you to the end of the block. You go on all fours and I'll run on two legs. Ah, you know. So, he says, you know what I mean. There's so many parts of the human body that aren't designed to work right. And, you know, and he tried to name one. I could name what it really did and so on. He was just getting horribly frustrated. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, you know, which was kind of the point. And, but finally, you know, we go through a whole bunch of these things. And he says, well, what are you trying to say? Evolution makes the bad changes and creation makes the good changes. Yep, you got it. And <laughs> that did not sit well with him, but it sat really well with the, with the people. And it's just amazing. But anyway, mutations can't get you past creation. They can make bad changes in good created things, but they can't do any more than that. And so uh, this perfection of adaptations was what a famous evolutionist called the chief evidence of a supreme designer. One of my favorite examples, and we've actually had nesting pairs of these pileated woodpeckers uh, in our yard museum down in Arcadia. And so a woodpecker makes its living banging its head into trees. And when a woodpecker hits a tree, the deceleration experience is about a thousand times gravity. Well, we live in Florida. It used to be from the balcony of Cathcart Hall at Clearwater Christian College, you could see, you know, the, the smoke and the flame, you know, from the rockets that took off from Cape Kennedy. And, you, you know, the astronauts were all pushed back in their seats and stuff like that. Well, the woodpecker, it's a lot harder. Boy, oh, boy. And uh, so if you're going to, you know, make a living bang your head into a tree, you better have, you know, a heavy-duty bill, heavy-duty skull, some shock-absorbing tissue between the two, the right nerve and muscle coordination, a slip to the right or left, and the shearing force would literally spin the cover off the brain. And so, hmm, how did you get all that? Well, evolutionists always start with something simpler. Usually they'll just go back a step or two. So here we got a bird, so we already got beak and feathers and all that, but it isn't a woodpecker yet. It's just a regular bird, and for some reason, maybe frustration over losing the worm to the early bird, it throws its head into a tree, bang, you know, and chips a little piece of wood out, and a beetle falls out and grabs him. Hmm, maybe there's more. <laughs> so starts banging his head into the tree, but, you know, they just run and hide. I got to be able to dig a deeper hole. And so it really wham, you know, throws his head into a tree like that. What happens? Knocks himself silly. Okay, that's not going to work. So, but here's a mama bird flying along, minding her own business. Sots, gets hit with a cosmic ray. The first step in evolutionary progress is some sort of damage to DNA, a mutation 
something that makes a new trait. And this mama bird was carrying an egg. The radiation went right through her, but it hit one of the DNA genes in the little egg, and the baby bird was born with a heavy-duty beak. Wow. He decides to try it out. Whack. Throws his head into the tree, and he's drilling a big hole now. Looks like he's on the way to becoming a woodpecker, except what? Squishes in the front of his face. He's still got this weak, thin bird skull. Hmm. Well, if I said that to an evolutionist, you'd say, oh, you got the story backwards. You got it backwards. The first lucky mutation was the heavy-duty skull. That's what came first. Okay, rewind. Mom bird flying along. Zots gets hit with a cosmic ray. Little baby bird's born with a heavy-duty skull. Whack, throws his head into the tree. This time, the skull is okay, but crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. The bill all folds up like an accordion. <laughs> so you're nowhere unless both of those things happen at the same time. It's to Darwin's credit. That's the reason evolutionists don't really want you to read real Darwin. Uh, Darwin pointed out that things... He said, if there was anything, any feature of a living thing that couldn't happen one step at a time with each step having better survival value than the one before it, my theory would be wrong. He's been proven wrong 100,000 times and counting. And so neither, neither way you go, heavy skull, heavy bill, you got to have them both at the same time. But when you start doing things at the same time, the mathematical odds... Uh, make the, you know, if the universe were Googleplex years old, it still wouldn't be enough time to make anything like that happen. It'd be a lot of dead birds in the meantime. And so it just doesn't work. And that's not the end of the story. You know, if uh, woodpeckers can drill into wood, they need, but they're after beetles in the wood. And of course, the beetles hear all this pounding, and so they just crawl down their burrow further. So even if you had a heavy-duty bill and skull, you'd still go hungry. And you could hear the beetles laughing inside the tree, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, so what do you do? You get a long, sticky tongue. And so that little inset picture there, uh, you know, shows a long, sticky tongue. Wrap, it, it wraps all the way around the skull in a sheath and goes over the scalp and inserts into the right nostril like that. Well, where would you get a long, sticky tongue like that? Suppose you thought I got a long, sticky tongue just by chance. Here there's this long, sticky tongue hanging out of her bill. You keep biting on your tongue. That's got to be irritating. Flying along all over a low twig, your tongue wraps around the twig. You hang yourself. That's a real problem. <laughs> so the answer for a woodpecker is to sh uh, slip that in that sheath that goes all the way around the skull under the scalp. But there'd be no reason to have a tongue sheath without a tongue to put in it. Without a tongue and without the sheath, it'd be dangerous to have a long, sticky tongue. So you're right back to what? creation. Uh, all of the examples that I once used to prove evolution of my students, none of them are changes from one kind to another. Sometimes they're changes from one place to another. Animals move from here to there. But the DDT-resistant flies are still DDT-resistant. The ones that aren't still aren't. Pepper moth, flu virus, drug-resistant bacteria, lots of variation in kind. No changes from one kind to another. No production of higher animals. Uh, excellent example that used to be used for evolution. In fact, you know, there have always been groups of people or of single individuals that have hated other people from Cain and Abel onward. But Darwin introduced a new reason for hate. Most people didn't hate it. Their skin color was a matter of indifference. It didn't matter what color your skin was. You were hated because you lived on the wrong side of the river or, you know, you did something like that. But he introduced the idea, and Germany's uh, Darwin, Ernst Tackel, went along with it, of, uh, uh, you know, that people with darker skin colors were more primitive, more ape-like. Heckel actually said Australian aboriginals couldn't be taught to count as high as a horse. And he pictured them in trees with Australian koalas and other Australian animals, which is, shows how foolish Heckel was. I've spoken in aboriginal churches. Uh, they have, they're fully 100% totally human beings. And in fact, every person on the planet, except albinos, has exactly the same skin color. Do you know you've never met anybody with a skin color different from yours? 
Now, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, but what about, but what about? <laughs> no, we all have the same skin color protein, a protein called melanin. There are two versions of it. Uh, eumelanin grades that uh, brown to black, and phyomelanin for the Scotch-Irish that grades red to yellow. All of us have that same protein, and it's not just skin color. It's hair color and eye color and the back layer of the eye. So people that are out born albinos are always legally blind because of all the reflection inside the eye. And so this picture here shows five shades of skin color. I could really increase it to seven, but this shows the point all right. And the, the letters underneath the pictures you see there, let's see, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, the represent controller genes for how much melanin you're going to make. You have to have another gene to make the melanin. And then if you have all capital letter genes, you'll make a lot of melanin, have very dark skin. If you have no capital letter genes, just little a, little a, little b, little b, uh, like on the, the far right end is up, I guess as we're both looking at it, then you have very light skin, or you could be somewhere in the middle. Well, here's a mob that looks somewhat like that. So that's of eight of our 10 grandchildren. There have been two more grandchildren added and a couple of great grandchildren now, but uh, uh, they'll get in the picture one of the day. Uh, how'd that happen? Okay. Well, take a look at this. Uh, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how much melanin, what skin color our first parents have. But the Bible does tell us that Adam and Eve were to be the parents of all living, Eve in particular. It's to be the mother of all living. And so from a design point of view, the best place to start would be in the middle. That's where you get the most variation in the least amount of time. And so if Adam and Eve were medium skin tone, we could write their genes big and little a, big and little b. If both of them were that way, you'd see that cross there. And look what happens in one generation. Say so this would be Adam and Eve, their children, Cain, Abel, Seth, their brothers and sisters, and so on. And so at the time of reproduction, uh, the gene pairs separate. So the big and little a separate, the big and little b separate, and mix in all combinations. And so in one generation... The children of Adam and Eve, if they started medium skin tone, one out of 16 on the average would have all capitals be the darkest possible skin color. One would have all little letter genes, the lightest possible skin color. Less than half, six out of 16 or three eighths would be medium like their parents, four a shade darker, four a shade lighter. And notice, no death, no struggle, no war of nature, no long period of time. You can get all the variations we see among people living today in one generation. One generation, not a thousand years, not a million years, not a billion years, just one generation. But take a look at what happens in the next generation. Again, no struggle, no death. In other words, nothing remotely evolutionary going on here it's possible to get stuck in different places. And this would occur especially after the Tower of Babel. So at the Tower of Babel, God, you know, everybody else or the animals do what God says. They multiply and fill. They increase in numbers, reproduce, multiply, and then they scatter out into different environments. Man insisted on being rebellious. They multiplied, they increased the number, but they didn't fill anything. They huddled together in the plains of Shinar and built the Tower of Babel. So God comes down to confuse their languages to make them do what he told them to do to start with, scatter out. And so now, notice, if you have people with, uh, you know, one group might have moved away from Babel and taken only the capital A and B genes. Well, that's all they could pass on would be capital A and B. So their children would be very dark-skinned generation after generation, uh, like many of the inhabitants of Central Africa, for instance. On the other hand, if some of the people that moved away from the Tower of Babel took only the little letter genes, uh, this would just be a genetic drift breakup of a large population statistically, then they couldn't be any darker. They'd all be very light generation after generation. You could even get stuck in the middle. If both parents had two big A's and two little B's, for example, then the parents would always get two big A's and two little B's. They'd be medium generation after generation, like my ancestors, the American Indians, or the Polynesians, or the Orientals. And so again, no struggle, no death, no long period of time. And they would multiply and fill different environments. In God's providence, 
the light-skinned people, you know, or went up to the north where, uh, you know, there wasn't any problem with skin cancer from too strong a sunshine, but the light skin allowed what sun there was to make vitamin D for you. And the Australian aboriginals don't have any problem with skin cancer in, in Australia, but the English convicts that settled Australia have lots of problems with it. So I rode on a plane all the way across the continent between two guys discussing their skin cancer, and it's a national epidemic over there among the light-skinned uh, Englishmen. Well, uh, you've heard, you know, of the Genome Project, figuring out the genes that uh, people have. And sure enough, after all this study was done, the Human Genome Project concluded there's just one species. There's only one race, in fact, even a smaller designation of human beings. There's only one race. We're all parts of it. Well, I'll give you a chance to join me for 2020. Okay, in the 2000 uh, census that came out, you know, there's a place over there that says, uh, what race are you? And they give you a whole bunch of choices. Now, I thought about checking Native American, see if I could get in on some of the casino money. But uh, I kept looking on there. <laughs> Finally, I got the one I was looking for. Other. Okay, what race are you? Other, colon, blank. And so I put human. There's only one race, the human race, and we're all parts of it, Acts 17, 26. And I didn't get arrested or fined or anything, so I did it again in 2010. And so what do you think? Maybe you guys want to start the Acts 17, 26 society for Census 2020. That was what Paul preached on Mars Hill. And uh, uh, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill was very indicative of the, what you guys are trying to do in the conference here. So Paul goes into this uh, big uh, place in Athens where the intellectuals of the day like to, like to gather and try to trump one another with their ideas and stuff like that. And so Paul starts talking about Jesus crucified uh, for our sins so that we could be raised to new life. And the philosophers of the day and all the people educated at the University of Athens and so on what babbler is this? What fool is this? What moron is this? What do you mean? What in the world is this? Is sin? Who's Christ? What do you mean we're going to rise from the dead? What's going on here? You know, they didn't listen to anything. And so Paul left and kind of discouraged. Oh, he said, they forgot. They've forgotten the ABCs. They don't even know there is a creator. They're so hung up on their phony little beliefs. I've got to go back and do kindergarten teaching before I can reach these philosophers. So it goes back the next day, all right, realizing now he's talking to intellectuals who know nothing of common knowledge. <laughs> okay, so he's talking to them, and he says, starts off, as I came in, I went by this idol that you have to the unknown God. He whom you ignorantly worship, declare I unto you. And he starts talking about God. God is not made with our hands, all the wooden and stone idols that they had. God is the one who made us. And he gives a short creation seminar. We turned our backs on God and ruined the world in which we lived. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, okay, to pay the penalty for our sin, to restore our world to what it could be and should be. And what happened? Some laughed, but only some. The day before, they all laughed. This time, some laughed. Some said, we want to hear more, and what? Some believed. That's the situation that we face now. And you have no idea how thrilling it is for me to be part of this conference. So I've mentioned for 25, 35 years, you know, I did creation evolution debates on five continents against evolutionists, uh, usually atheistic, mean-spirited evolutionists. <laughs> but they gave up. They were completely out of ammunition. They tried to cancel debates. They, they didn't want to do debates anymore. And that's the time when some Christian compromisers, and you heard some about those in the earlier talks, say, well, we can get involved now. We'll take it over. We know how to handle these guys. We can show that you can be Christian and still believe in evolution. That's a much harder debate. Because now, you know, supposedly you're, you're facing off against a Christian brother, although, wow, it's certainly a wildly different kind of an idea. And 
they twist scripture. That's the only way you can get to that point in the first place. And then they, use, they usually twist the science. They don't know it's twisted because they thought the evolutionists were telling the truth. But boy, oh boy, that's when the slide began to really drop. In the Answers magazine from AIG this month, okay, they pointed out that uh, the Gallup poll has been tracking, uh, you know, belief in creation since 1982. And originally, uh, the largest subgroup was Christians who believe God created Adam and Eve looking pretty much like people about a few thousand years ago. Some Christians believe God used evolution and man came along over millions of years, but very few believed in atheistic evolution. Now the atheistic evolutionists have grown, the science falsely so-called group, and it's a tie between the compromising Christians that want to fit in evolution as God's means of creation. We need a lot more churches doing conferences like you've done here today with the point. I got a whole bunch of points from the speakers I've heard already that I fully intend to incorporate, if nobody objects, into my future talks. There's a desperate need for exactly what you're doing here. Well, the cartoonist BC kind of summarized it this way. Oft times I've wondered what the world is all about. It can't be just a place for... Uh, a place for... I think I used to, I'll, I'll just say what I think it was. <laughs> can't be just a place for coming in and going out. It can't be just a place for terrorists and crooks and dirty, rotten scoundrels who sell pornographic books. So that first line kind of looks like our world. Our world wasn't made for wallowing in sickness, death, and sin, or people who give drugs to kids or beat up on their kin. And then I'll enlarge the last two little frames there. Our world was once a perfect place, a gift of love, not war. That's what he said in the cartoon. Well, according to the Bible, blank is love. God is love. What did Darwin substitute for God? The war of nature, famine and death. Our world was once a perfect place, a gift of God's love, not Darwin's war. And we still have the power, not in ourselves, but through grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to make it like before. <laughs> I told you about one of the Clearwater Christian uh, graduates, he's a biology major, but he was in, in, uh, helped by a lot of the professors there. He added this to my talk. You may have seen these little Darwin bumper stickers, <laughs> the Christian fish with Darwin in the middle of it. So Vance says, here, let me show you what natural selection is really all about. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so that's the idea.